API complexity is very complex. On top of this, you also add the fact that you have different data models across different systems. And so it's very hard to actually synchronize your schema properly. This is what makes enterprise systems connection integration very expensive. I wish I knew I should go with enterprise clients faster. I think there is a very big space to build a real product that actually just works, competing to actually outreach and loveless. This is really what I would call for startups and I would be myself a subscriber. Hi everybody, welcome to the Deveco Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Oleg Sarikov and today I'm excited to have Ruben Burdin, founder and CEO of StackSync. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Ruben. Hey Oleg, nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Thanks for joining the video podcast. Thank you. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue. Perfect. Entrepreneurship gave me... Resilience and strength. Entrepreneurship deprived me... Sleep. My main superpower is... Product and convincing. My main weakness is... <laughs> Sleep management. When I'm afraid I... Pray. Could you walk us through the story of founding Stacks Think? Was there a specific problem or gap in the market that you wanted to address? It started as when I was having actually the problem myself in a previous consulting job where actually I was trying to have bidirectional sync between two different systems and I couldn't find anything on the market which actually would just do it. So this is where actually I decided to start to build something small MVP in-house and then at some point with code while searching you know, for cost snippets online, etc. I realized, hey, actually there is nothing. Everybody's complaining that should exist, but there is no resources for this. So then I was like, okay, this is a very big hole in the market, a very big potential technology. Everybody was complaining this should exist. And so then I committed and I started to do it for real. And here we are today. StackSync operates in the enterprise data space. What makes thinking enterprise data in real time so challenging? Because like a streaming is both complex and extremely expensive when it's not managed very well, as well as all the systems which are now cloud-based basically have API rate limits and the API complexity is very complex. On top of this, you also add the fact that you have different data models across different systems. And so it's very hard to actually synchronize your schema properly. This is what makes enterprise systems connection and integration very expensive. Because there is a lot of bugs, you have to actually spend a lot of time and cost in maintenance. And all of these efforts actually make it almost impossible in the long run to maintain. This is where texting comes in. What was the hardest technical hurdle you had to overcome in building a real-time two-way data sync engine? We have, of course, the conflict resolution mechanism is extremely hard to actually develop. It's very complex and has to be very robust. We have to guarantee eventual consistency, but most importantly, the scale. StackSync is really built for enterprise at scale. And so whether you come with like 10,000 records or 50 billion records in a table, StackSync works exactly the same way and actually powers the exact same performance. So this is really what StackSync offers. It's a peace of mind that you don't have actually to handle scale differently as you would handle a small deployment because StackSync manages all of this complexity for you. Are there any key lessons that you have learned you wish you knew when you started your entrepreneurial journey? I wish I knew I should go with enterprise clients faster and also that design and appearance of the brand counts a lot, but counts as well when you start a startup. So at the very beginning, when you don't have so much founding, maybe having a designer is probably a problem for the rich people. But actually, you realize as you go to the more to the enterprise market, you move forward, your product develops. Hiring a designer is probably one of the choices we should have made earlier. Are there any underrated opportunities or blind spots in B2B SaaS or enterprise tech space that you think founders should be paying attention to? There is a very big blind spot into the sales technology. So actually, we have a lot of AI SDR, which actually are just a workflow under the hood, just like a workflow wrapped. And if you look at the onboarding steps of these companies, it's just basically like building a workflow and it's very manual. So this AI SDR, etc., really not more than a workflow. Right now, we have like some products, Outreach and Lambless. And I think there is a very big space to build a real product that actually just works, competing to actually Outreach and Lambless. This is really what I would call for startups. And I would be myself a subscriber. In your experience, what is the biggest misconception enterprise teams have about implementing AI in their data stacks? AI, you know, is great, but it's also misunderstood on how it actually behaves. I see a lot of enterprises in the B2B space, enterprise space, which actually want to use AI because AI is hyping and, you know, they're going to get their bonus because they use AI. So at least they say, okay, well, let's ask AI to do this workflow. So at least they ask, at least they pretend and expect AI to actually give a predefined output when actually this is what 
workflow should do, where you have like a defined input and a defined output and a clear path. But actually, because AI is black box, they sometimes deviating and strange behaviors in the workflow and say, but why it's not working? You are using AI, which is actually non-deterministic output to actually treat a deterministic process. And this is where actually there is a lot of confusion. So there is a lot of space on how you actually save Quart, Quart Rail and actually implement AI within workflows. What excites you the most about where AI is heading in the data infrastructure space, particularly in that space? So what excites me the most is personally where actually AI helps you configure and actually set up pipelines and workflows and all this. So actually it's more like a co-pilot and assistant to you rather than something that you use to actually build workflows. So there are two different steps. For example, StackSync, we integrate AI into this assistant way as well into the way you actually use AI to power some tasks. Really what excites me, I mean, both excite me, but one where you actually get an entire configuration of your stack done easily. This is what excites me the most. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising for tech talent? I really find that Europe has a lot of tech talents which are still undiscovered and I think there's a real lack of capital and venture in the mindset of the people to actually enable and actually encourage all of these amazing entrepreneurs to actually start. Right now it's changing. We see a lot of additional French, German, Swiss founders. The opportunities of the market there because it's less dynamic makes it very hard to create and start a company. And so this is why I think the mindset of people should pretty change to actually enable all of this entrepreneurship and space you know, to bloom. StackSync has an in-house team, which is definitely a big decision in the tech industry. What led you to prioritize an in-house approach or outsourcing? Staxing has an in-house team of developers because our product is extremely complex. It's a very complex technology to master from the beginning. So I feel like it is possible to outsource some tasks, for example, say front-end, you know, UI, etc. But in terms of back-end, it's very hard for us to actually outsource. And this is why we do not outsource the sections. But as we grow, you know, there are also part of the company who can think about outsourcing. But we're now actually busy building out a very strong team in-house, which actually build our startup spirit and our startup culture. Maintaining an in-house development team can be challenging. What strategies have you employed to effectively manage and nurture its internal development talent? What we do on daily basis is organize work over Jira, organize tasks, and also we are a remote team across two continents. We have to coordinate across different time zones, and so we are handling this very effectively. A second thing we do is actually we invest into team retreats where everybody gets to meet at least twice a year. So this is where the real magic of building relationships across team members really happens. Reflecting on your business operations and the specific tasks or projects that you believe you could potentially benefit from outsourcing, what criteria would you use to determine whether it's sustainable for external cooperation? What's important for external cooperation is actually the responsiveness of a partner. When we ask a question, we want an answer 24-7 instant. That's a big expectation we have in our team and for our clients. And that's also what we're going to have also for partners. And also the kind of the stability, right? We don't want a partner where we know which provide like a developer, but for example, it rotates every second week. We want someone actually which manage the complexity of hiring abroad, but actually have something. I'm not saying that we actually want to go that way, but we would like to really develop this in-house team first. In the future, would you be open considering something outside of development outsourcing? Because there are other activities, for example, quality assurance, design, infrastructure, not only development, or everything from this you want to keep in-house. Right now, you know, I have to think about it. For now, actually, we have a strategy to actually grow up to the next level, like internally. But I would definitely think about some outsourcing, some part of operations, if this really makes sense. This is really something which can really benefit everyone. Drawing from your own experience, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs or probably individuals looking to disrupt traditional industries with innovative technology solutions. One of the mindset is to, first of all, don't try to go too small, actually go enterprise directly if you guys can. That's very important. And a second advice is also to value your time much more than you value money because you can get a lot of money but you can't get a lot of time. So really try to spend wisely on accelerating your roadmap as much as possible. How an, an individual or beginning entrepreneur can approach enterprise clients if they just a small startup i think it's not only from financial perspective difficult but also from mental because they are small how can they think about yeah. the beginning don't you find it scaring for them 
Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, branding changes a lot, perception. But I cannot say maybe enterprise, but also at least mid-market. If you go with clients which spend like 200 bucks a month for a subscription of an enterprise product, which can be sold to 10k a month, that's actually really a bad feedback loop and you might engage into too much support and actually plumbing your operations on the future. So I really recommend you trying to value your product to the right to its right value, so to speak. But like enterprise, in the beginning, you have to start somehow small with design partners and whoever is willing to actually support you. So in the beginning, just take this. But as you get mature, don't fear to move faster on these dimensions. Ruben, really, thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Interesting vision. I hope my audience will like our podcast. Thank you so much, Oleg. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Deveco Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.